Hello everyone. Today I want to talk about problem definitions. The, uh, the process of taking the information you learned from your background research and developing a coherent, complete, but also concise description of the problem that you're going to need to be solving. And there are several pieces to problem definition. I'm going to go through these three components in this brief lecture. Uh, one is problem statement or point of view. This is the high level picture, the main thing that you're focusing on for the project. Uh, secondarily are the stakeholder or customer needs and wants. This is where you dive into more of the details. What are the specific things that a really good design will have in it? And then finally, a project scope quantified by a, uh, a boundary sketch. So here's where you're defining the, the bounds of what you're going to be focusing on for your design. Um, we could design anything, but we always have constraints. And so the boundary sketch is where you're establishing where the constraints for this particular design challenge are. And this is an important way to communicate to your, your sponsor and your stakeholders what it is you're going to be doing. Um, so let me talk about the problem statement first. We call this also a point of view. The point of view is just a way of looking at a problem. So that's why we use that terminology. You're concisely stating the problem um, to give yourself some perspective on it. So what is a problem statement? Well, it's effectively just that brief summary of who the important people are for the problem, what is it they need, and a little bit about some insight into them. What have you learned from your research? So the focus of the problem statement is to identify the root cause that you're trying to address and give a little bit of a path towards the solution or the ideal state. Um, so, for example, if you know that uh, you have a, a root cause, which is that a person is unable to get educated, um, you might, uh, you have several different ways of approaching that. You could enable them to participate in education remotely. You could provide a custom educator for them on site. You could give them a means of transporting themselves to where they can get education. Um, and while all of those are valid solutions, there might be a reason that you don't want to consider all of them, that you have already in mind a, a path. So that's a good thing to include in the problem statement. Um, the problem statement answers three main questions, who, what, and why. So it's going to point you in the right direction. And another thing about a problem statement is that it's generative. What I mean by this is it's going to help you generate ideas. Um, the whole purpose of doing a problem statement is to make sure you fully understand the problem, but even more importantly, to allow you to get really awesome solutions to that problem. So you want to have a statement which excites you, helps you create new ideas. You've got great descriptions in that statement. It's not, a very, it's not intended to be a boring thing because that's not going to help you get new ideas. So the problem statement answers these three questions. Who's going to benefit from the solution? So you need to make sure you identify the key stakeholders or stakeholder in the design. Um, what is the problem or the unmet need is another way that that's referred to. So here you want to make sure you're stating what the root cause is, not what the customer or stakeholder has told you, but what you've figured out based on observing them, doing background research, studying what's been done in the past, you've been able to identify, here's the key thing that we need to solve. And then finally, um, why why does the person need this? What, so that's not a great way I put it that there. Why is this insightful? Um, why, why are you doing this? Include the insights that you gained about the user and the need in, in the problem statement. All right, uh, so here's a quick example. A poor problem statement might be something like build a better mousetrap. You might have heard that expression. That's really what it is, just an expression. It's not a great problem statement, specifically because it misses the who and the why. It's the what. We need a mousetrap. Okay, fine. Um, so how could we rewrite this? So for example, here is a much longer problem statement that includes aspect of the who and the why. So first off, a little bit of background information. This sets the context. Why? And it's part of the why. Why do we need a new mousetrap? Well, because current mousetraps expose people to viruses as they handle the trap and dispose of the mouse. That's not the only reason we might want a new mousetrap, but that's why this particular problem got started. Secondly, the who and the what. The homeowners are the people that we're addressing. So we're not trying to make a mousetrap for an industrial setting. It's for uh, an end-use consumer. And then finally, the what. 
We need a low cost system to trap and dispose of a mouse. And now I want to point that out because we use the term mouse trap and we pretty much all know what that is, but this gets more specific. And you want to be cautious with your use of words in your problem statement because by saying a mouse trap, you're going to immediately get that vision of that old spring style one. There are lots of other ways that you can trap mice. Um, and if you use the term mousetrap, you might not think of those alternative solutions. So be careful with the words that you use here. And then finally, the why is the without being exposed to viruses being carried on the mouse. Um, so that's that insight that you're gaining. So try to capture these three things, the who, what, and why in your problem statement. And it takes a little while. You usually go through a couple of iterations before you find one that, that really helps you generate solutions. And that's totally okay. You can change your problem statement over time. Again, it's this high level picture. As long as um, it's working for you, then you keep that statement. When you stop getting ideas from it, you revisit it and change the wording around and see if you can get some more ideas that way. So let's do a quick exercise. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to pause the video and for two minutes, Try to think of a draft problem statement for your project. And I put up here a, a Mad Lib, if you've ever done that as a kid. Um, is a, this is a way of quickly getting a problem statement down. Um, this customer needs a way to uh, build a better mousetrap <laughs> because of the um, potential of being exposed to viruses. So something like that, you can package it quickly here, and then you can massage the wording later on. But this gives you sort of the basics, the, the who, the what and the why captured. So pause here and then restart after you've written one. So uh, let's talk about how we go a little bit more in depth. So once you've got a, a problem statement that you feel is a good generative problem statement, you then want to elaborate on that. Not within the problem statement, that needs to be high level, but you have lists attached to it. And the, the main list is the list of stakeholder needs and wants. So again, this is refining that problem definitions. Got the problem statement. Now let's see what else a solution has to have in order to be considered a good design. Um, these are the things that you recognize are essential to delivering on a good design. And when I say essential, I probably shouldn't say that because needs are essential, wants are not. So keep that in mind as well, that sometimes you've identified things that would be uh, beneficial to the final product but are not essential and maybe you even have some sort of ranking of their importance as you're capturing this list. Where do those needs and wants come from? Well obviously from the stakeholders themselves. Um, they might say things like they need it to be low cost. Uh, they might also not state something but you observe it while you're watching them. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, can you see, you see how they're currently dealing with this current situation. So what can you glean from that, that uh, they, they might need as part of the final solution? And then lastly, all this other research you've done can contribute that. In particular, standards, regulations, what the competition is doing, you're gonna learn from all of that and that might give you some additional needs and wants. So it's not, key here is it's not just what the stakeholders tell you. There's a lot that you're adding to this as well based on what you've learned. Okay, I want to step back for a minute um, and talk a little bit more about um, needs versus wants from um, the perspective of relative importance and, and what we've learned or what the auto industry learned about this. Um, it's kind of a, a neat diagram. This is called the Kano diagram and it identifies effectively three types of needs or three types of wants, if you will. Um, the, they're the basic, the performance, and the excitement. Let's start down at the bottom one, the basic need. You can see this graph here. Uh, you either didn't do it at all on the left-hand side or you did it very well on the right. And then similarly, the customer is unhappy or very happy. So obviously, when you're developing a product, you want your customer to be very happy, very satisfied. The problem with a basic need is that the best you can do with customer satisfaction is not make them unhappy. So from an automotive perspective, does it start? every time you want it to start? Does it stop every time you want it to stop? It's the basic functionality. Does the radio turn on when you want the radio to turn on? Um, you, the only thing you can do with basic needs is screw them up. You can't get any additional customer satisfaction from them. Performance needs are a, a bit more helpful to trying to satisfy your customer because um, you, the better you do at them, the more happy your customer is. So for example, if you're selling a car that is a 
appealing to people who like the ex feeling of acceleration, then you can deliver faster acceleration and you will get more satisfaction from that faster acceleration. Um, that, that's an example. There, there are lots of examples like this. Simple things like um, how easily does the door open? Um, certainly the door has to open. That's a basic need. Um, but how easy it is to operate the level, lever, how easy it is to find it. Being able to find it easier is a little bit of a performance need. You can get a little bit of customer satisfaction if you have an auto open door or something like that. So let's talk about excitement needs. These are the really interesting ones. We take it a step further where um, this is something the customer didn't even know they wanted. So if it's not there, they're not going to be dissatisfied because they didn't know it existed. But as soon as you give it to them, it's like, wow, this is awesome. I love this. First time I got into a car that synced up with my phone, that was really exciting for me. Um, now, of course, I expect every car to have that. So one of the things that's interesting is that the first company to introduce these excitement needs gets a lot of benefit. The next company, it becomes a performance need, and over time, it becomes simply a basic need, an expectation. So something to kind of keep in mind, not specifically relevant to senior project, but as you move on further in your career, um, what kind of need are we talking about? Is it a basic, a performance, or an excitement need? Okay, so let's look at the picture, the overall picture of senior project. How does this fit in? Why are we bothering to do this? So you've done this design research, right? You're identifying the current solutions, what the stakeholders need and want, what are the technical challenges. You're gonna take this and it's gonna lead to, um, next week what we do is um, a quality function deployment. You'll generate a house of quality from that. The house of quality will give you specifications for your final design. So you're gonna take those needs, run them through the house of quality, and on the other side you're gonna get specifications. Um, the other thing the design research has done for you is help you understand the problem so you can break it into manageable chunks. We call that functional decomposition. We'll do that in a few weeks. And then from that functional decomposition, you're going to focus on coming up with solutions for your different functions independently. Divide and conquer. Make the problem manageable for yourself. Now, here's where they start to, to feed more directly into each other. That house of quality, you generated um, the needs, or, or rather you had the needs from the design research that went into the house of quality, that's going to give you the criteria you need to evaluate your individual function ideas. You're going to do a, a simple de decision matrix called a Pew matrix that's going to allow you to look at a particular function and see how well you did. For that Pew matrix, you use those um, customer needs that you've identified. Then you're gonna take the best results from the Pew matrix, combine them together in something called a morphological matrix, and then get whole system level solutions at the end. And here's where the specifications come in. So the specifications give you some criteria that will go into a full weighted decision matrix, which will evaluate various system solutions, and then finally, that's going to give you a design direction. So this is an overview of the first quarter of our senior project. Your design direction is the outcome of this, and that's what your preliminary design review covers. So we'll hit this slide each week as we talk about the, the new topics, but I wanted to give you the overview of how it's all fitting together. So right now, we're looking at getting those needs and wants out of that design research. Okay, quickly, I wanted to talk about project scope. You've had an initial scope proposed by your project sponsor. The problem is that you haven't had a chance to evaluate that scope yet. It's had a cursory review by me as the course organizer, but now you've learned a lot more since uh, it was originally proposed. So the project scope is a way of you balancing what the stakeholder or sponsor wants versus what you're able to deliver. So your stakeholder and need research identified what they want, your product research identified what's already been done. Your technical research is giving you a feel for what's going to actually be possible. And your project advisor or coach gives you the perspective of what can actually be achieved in a year. You put that all together with what you can do in three quarters, and you're going to have a proposed scope. Um, Thursday depends on which year that you're watching this, but you will review that with your advisor to verify. Um, that your advisor is happy with the scope that you propose. Your proposed scope might be different from what your sponsor wants initially. You need to talk with them about that. Don't just spring this on them in the scope of work document. Have a meeting, discuss why you made those choices first. 
Okay, so visual on that, again, your sponsor wants usually everything, and what you can deliver is not everything. So this is the balance that you're trying to find here, and that's okay, this is the time to do that. So don't feel like, in fact, please don't try to say, oh, I've gotta do what my sponsor asked for. Let's figure out now what's possible and get their agreement before we go further forward in the project. So how do we capture this in a visual fashion? That's something we call a boundary sketch. Um, wait, to create a boundary sketch, you're just gonna create a sketch of drawing of the current situation, showing the user how they interact with the, the current objects that they're trying to manipulate or use. Um, and then what's the input and the output of this system or this process? You try to capture that visually, and then you're gonna draw a line around the portion of that that you are allowing yourself to change. So that's basically establishing the scope of your control. Outside objects, objects outside of that line should be on the sketch if they influence the project, but they should be outside the line identifying that you're not in control, you're not changing those. You have to work with their limitations. So that's your visual definition. Here are a couple of quick examples. Um, this project was designing an, an auto wine bottle opener and pourer, so they identified sort of the components they anticipated being involved um, and that it would need power, and obviously there's a wine bottle and a glass, but they weren't changing those. So it's this visual um, perspective of what they were going to be designing in the project. Here's another one. Uh, this was to remove um, powder from metal 3D printed parts. Uh, current process is not quite as crude as they show there when someone's shaking it, but it had elements of that. Um, and so what they were changing was what was inside the dotted line there. They were coming up with a method to shake out the powder, not changing the user, not changing the heat treatment or the, the fusion printer. So those are just a couple of quick examples. Every project is gonna have a different sketch, but we think it's really useful for you to capture that sketch um, to, to show your scope. Okay, so putting into practice, now it's on you. Um, you've got a draft problem statement. Take that back to your team. Um, everybody should have one. You can compare them, massage them, come up with some other wording. Evaluate it. Does it make sense to you? Does it work? If not, edit it. Try to, to go through a few iterations before you, you have your final problem statement in your scope of work. Um, list out those, those needs and wants based on your research. Come up with some specifications. We'll need those um, next week when we get to quality function deployment, so you can start thinking about them now. Create that boundary sketch in order to define your scope, and if you have defined your scope considerably different from what your sponsor proposed, have a meeting with them and explain why that is. Um, and as always, as you're working on a project, have a list of the things that you think you're gonna need to know, but you don't know already, so you can dive into those. All right, I will see you in class.